and I will show you now our very, very silly little demo that we've put together. So the demo application that we're going to be building today, uh, this is the front end. We're not going to be rebuilding a front end because that's just boring and I suck at building front ends. Uh, but the idea is it's a number guessing game. The idea is we've got a web service provided elsewhere. We can look at the code for that as well if you want. It generates, every single minute, it generates a new random number between 0 and 255. Uh, you go ahead, you can come into this application. I'll start off as a new user. You're able to claim funds once. Uh, there's no real money in this. You claim funds, you get 100 bucks, or call whatever unit you want. And now I can go ahead and I can place a bet. So I'm going to say I want to uh, bet that the next number is going to be 50, and I'm going to bet 80 bucks on this. Bet placed. Here's my bet history. You can see that my funds have gone down to 20. And when the round finishes, since I don't think anyone else is betting this round, I'm going to win because I was the closest uh, to the right number. And sure enough, I'm back up to 100 and I've won. So it's not a very exciting application. It's not intended to be exciting. Uh, it's intended to let us look at the code. And so we're going to go ahead and dive into how an, how a an, uh, Colme application is put together. Uh, if we don't get through all of it, that's fine. I'd rather answer questions about the way this is set up uh, than anything else. So I've put together a little scaffold to make this a little uh, less painful than just typing in every single line of code that I'd have to type in here. Uh, this is a standard Rust application. Uh, I'm using standard Rust server-side code. And one of the things that I'm going to point out from the beginning, we're going to end up with a single executable, which is going to be running the entire blockchain. It's going to be producing blocks. It is going to have the bots built in. The bots are going to run once a minute and are going to pull in whatever the newest, uh, the newest result is and settle that on chain. And we're going to have an indexer built into this as well, which is going to observe all of the transactions on chain and build up the leaderboard. Uh, for people who have not worked in, a, in, a DAP, in DAP development before, I'll point out these kinds of things. Typically, we're looking at having multiple different executables, or at the very least, you would have a single off-chain executable and a single smart contract and have to have some kind of an awkward split of logic between the two of them. Uh, instead, we're going to be able to see how we're able to build all these things relatively simply here. The core of any Colme application is going to be some kind of a data type that represents uh, the application itself. So here we're going to have something called guess game. Uh, we have a public key that represents the signature that uh, every single random number is going to be signed with so that we, we can ensure that the numbers are actually coming in from the correct data source. And Genesis Info tells us how we should start off the chain. Just jumping down here, you can see that this uh, Genesis Info has some basic information. It has an identifier, just a unique string. Lots of, cha lots of chains use something called a chain ID. We just have an arbitrary string that people can use. We also have the validator set. Given the fact that this is a silly demo and there's no real money involved, we don't have to be particularly secure. And so what we've set up is a basic setup. There's a single validator. The validator works as the processor, the listeners, and the approvers. And you only have to have one of those uh, in order to, uh, to meet a quorum. However, if you actually wanted to write a secure, proper application, we, the, uh, the correct setup here is to have multiple listeners. You can have as many as you want. Uh, and then you can have a quorum of it, however many you want to have as well. This is very similar to the way multi-sig works on most other chains. Uh, our recommendation for proper financial applications is to have a three of five quorum for both the listeners and the approvers. Coming back up here, we also have this thing called guest message. Every single blockchain application has some kind of an API that you're able to interact with in order to send transactions. These are usually called messages. And within the Colmate, we have this as well. So guest message is the application-specific kind of message, and we have three of these. One of them is grad funds, which says that I'm going to go at, every single account is entitled to get $100 once. So you can go ahead and get that. You can place a bet, which says this is the number that I think it's going to be, and this is the amount of funds that I want to place the bet for. And finally, settle bet. And settle bet, I'm going to hold off on just a little bit. When we get to the bots, it's going to be a little bit interesting uh, how this works. It's fully permissionless, which is the important part uh, that I'm going to want to get into. And finally, every Colme application also has to, ha has to define its state. Uh, this normally happens in a blockchain application as an arbitrary key value store. Uh, I am a very big fan of Rust and strong typing, and so everything here is done with strong typing as well. 
So our guest state says the, the state of the application, which is made up of three different pieces. One is, what is the public key of the service which is signing the random numbers? What is, what are the, uh, what is the hash, the map of all of the different accounts uh, that have already received funds? Uh, the block height is here just for, interesting, for interest. We could have used a set instead. And finally, pending wagers. Every time you place a bet, it goes into this data structure. Uh, the guest timestamp tells you which minute uh, you know, which round of betting we're looking at. And then there's a, a vector here of all of the different wagers. You may notice this term Merkle popping up quite a bit here. Merkle is, uh, Merkle map is a crate that is a dependency of uh, Colme. And this is how we do all of our state management. It does an efficient, uh, it does efficient diffing, efficient, and it's able to reuse storage quite a bit. Uh, this is, uh, you know, so cloning is free. Uh, for people who are familiar with Rust, it, normally we have deep uh, cloning. In this case, it's able to do shallow cloning and then do copy on write. Uh, so it's able to make the modifications only when you actually need to make modifications. Serialization is very cheap. And this is how we're able to handle all of the different state management within Colme. Colme gets deployed as its own blockchain, and then it's able to have connectors via bridge contracts to as many different blockchains as you want. And so we stay chain agnostic in that sense. The logic is not going to live on Solana or Ethereum. The, the logic is going to live in Colme itself. And then the only thing that you're going to see on, let's say, Solana and Ethereum, is going to be the fund deposits and basic authentication. One of our biggest pain points that we've run into is, especially on smaller chains, uh, they, they have a very difficult time onboarding users because I already have MetaMask set up. I have, why should I have to install whatever your random uh, wallet is? And lots of applications in alternative chains have been hurt by that. The alternative to that is sticking to EVM, but EVM has its own limitations. And uh, to be honest, a lot of people are moving away from EVM, moving towards things like Solana. Okay, so since I'm a huge fan of going to run the thing and then find out what's broken, I've launched this. Here, let me come back to main. So we, uh, so coming back over here, we set up our guest game. We then set up our store. Uh, Kome, we, we currently have two primary data stores. We have, we may add more in the future. Uh, Postgres and Fial. Fial is a local uh, file system-based store, and that's what we're going to be using in this demo, but Postgres is very nice uh, from a DevOps perspective. Uh, launch the Kome application. And this, this thing here, the Kome, every single Kome application is built off of a core plus components. The core here is the thing that's going to manage the chain state. It's going to be able to execute transactions, uh, but it can't produce blocks. It can't do anything else that's very interesting. Uh, and then we run lots of different components on top of that. Each one of these components adds in additional capabilities. Uh, you can see that I've commented these things out and we'll be uh, developing these together right now. And so, for example, we have an indexer, we have API server, we have a few different things, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I've gone out and I've launched this. We now have a running executable. And what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to run this thing to actually send a transaction. You can see that our transactions are all in JSON. It's very easy to be able to understand, uh, relatively easy to understand what's going on inside a Colme transaction. And at the moment, we're getting an error. And the error is because we're not actually running our API server component. That's very easy to fix. I can just uncomment that. And point of this is, yes, the components are completely optional. You don't have to run an API server. You can run your API server in some executables and not others, whatever makes sense for your application. Running this, uh, coming back here, relaunching, and then running again. There we go. There we go. Okay. And now we're getting another error message, and the error is and not yet implemented because that's what we're going to be doing now. And I'm going to see if I can actually pull off any kind of live coding at this point. So this is coming from app line 125. And what I've done is I've gone ahead and I've implemented this execute method. Any, any Colme application has to implement execute and has to say, how is it that I want to be able to handle all the incoming uh, transactions? In this case, grab funds. That's the first one that we're going to end up implementing. And what we want to do is we want to assign 100, uh, 100 assets to the user that's in the transaction. And we want to update our state to make sure that they're not able to do that again. And so let's go ahead and get information. This context provides us all the information about the incoming transaction. There we go. And we're going to get the height. And now we'll do it the other way. 
let's first make sure that the user did not previously get any transactions. So from within our context, oh shoot, I hate doing it this way. So we're going to get our application state. We're gonna look at the receive funds and we're gonna check, has this sender already received the funds? And if they've already received funds, now I'll do it the other way again. If already received, we're going to generate an error and say already received funds. But if they have not already received the funds, then I'm going to update the app state this time. And we're going to go ahead and mint for that user $100 and we're done. So this is a basic, uh, if it worked, there we go. So this is a basic implementation of a, uh, of a Colme transaction, of a Colme message. If I recompile this and run it, we're and get used to this. We're just going to see more error messages, but it's going to be different error messages each time. And we get another error message. So this time we're going to get line 138. And 138 this time is going to be placing the bet. So by place it with, in this case, instead, we now want to be able to update our data structure to say that the user, that this user has placed a bet. So let's go ahead and do something very similar to what we did above. Guess timestamp. And this part is, is kind of interesting. What we're going, what we're doing here, uh, guess timestamp is a helper data type. It goes ahead and makes sure that we, uh, we're always on one minute boundaries instead of one second boundaries. And you'll notice instead of looking up what is the current time, we do this thing called ctx.block time. We need to make sure that every single transaction is fully reproducible within Colme. And so we make sure that the block time that we're getting come, that the times we're getting comes from the block as opposed to from the system clock. This, uh, this allows us to keep full reproducibility with everything that we're running. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong thing. Now, when I place a bet, the next thing I'm going to do is I need to burn the asset. And you may notice we're not doing transfers. We're not like locking up tokens in another smart contract or something like that. Since we control the entirety of the chain and the chain state, we're able to simply burn and mint uh, tokens at any point. This is another one of those advantages we get of being the complete uh, owners of the chain. We don't have to worry about someone trying to cheat us and uh, steal money because we're the ones who are writing it. Okay, so we've burned the asset. We're going to update our pending wagers. You'll notice we're using very, if anyone, who, anyone who's familiar with Rust, you'll notice we're using very common Rust idioms. We're not having to jump to some kind of database language or we're not using some kind of blockchain specific data structures. This is just a very standard map kind of interface. And now we're going to get the, uh, get the current wagers for the timestamp that we're looking at. And we're going to insert the wager. The wager is going to have an account. That's going to be the sender. We already have the guess and the amount. And at the end of this, we are also going to log some information. Logs are another thing that are very common in blockchain applications. Instead of storing all the data that you want to have inside the blockchain state itself, a lot of the time what we do is we end up generating logs and then allowing an indexer to come afterwards, parse those logs, and generate some kind of a more efficient data structure off-chain where it's cheaper to maintain uh, it's not quite as necessary in the case of Colme as other uh, chains, but it's still a good best practice to follow. And what we have here is a log message, which I set up in advance. Uh, and now we'll be able to parse this later on. And by running this, we're now actually finally able to place our bets. And with a fully written version of the code, I'll reload this. In addition to having the processor running, which is actually producing the blocks, we have an indexer running. The indexer is going to, uh, this is just the one piece that I really like to show off. The indexer is actually dead simple to run. 
Uh, I've written indexers multiple times. I've worked with external uh, indexing frameworks. By building this directly into the application, we have access to the entirety of the blockchain history. And running this indexer is as simple as waiting for the next block to be available. And then, uh, oh, here. In run once, what we do is we simply wait for the next block to become available. We get the block. We get the logs for the block. We then run this update function, which parses all of the logs, updates an internal data structure, and then that's uh, available to us to be able to make queries. And so you may have noticed, played here, the leaderboard is uh, populated from the indexer. Instead of needing to run multiple different executables and run your own complete chain locally, any kind of dev that you're going to be doing, you're going to have a single executable you're running from your machine. Uh, it massively simplifies uh, not just testing, but overall development. Uh, this, is a, this is a separate component. This is the indexer component. And the indexer wants to see every single block and then process it. It doesn't have control of producing the blocks. The pr uh, production of blocks is going to come in from the, uh, from the processor itself. The way the processor is going to decide to produce a block is when a new transaction shows up. In our case, there are basically three kinds of transactions that we'd care about. Either someone wants to get more funds, they want to place a bet, or at the end of every minute, then we're able to uh, land a block, uh, land a transaction to say this is the uh, this is the result. So anytime one of those things happens, we're going to produce a new block. If there, you know, this application has been sitting around running for a while, and uh, you know, even though it's been up for days, not the one we're running locally, the real one, I think we're only at like block height fifty. We're not doing useless work, uh, which. I understand why a lot of other blockchains need to do it. And, you know, if they have those use cases where we're looking for consensus and we're looking for decentralization in that kind of a sense, whether it's real decentralization or not, if they're looking for that, it makes perfect sense why they would have to set things up where it's going to produce a block on a regular basis. But we've seen plenty of smaller blockchains. Lots of the blocks end up totally empty. Yeah, so Colme is live. We have live applications on in production currently running on it. This is available for people who want to be building their own applications. If you're a founder, if you're a, if if you've got a product idea, we love working with founders and product and product, you know, visionaries, product visionaries. Come talk to us, Wes, myself, Russell. We're all going to be around the conference. Uh, we'd love to hear about it. And uh, thanks. Cool.